um, survival. It's what is the etiology of things like post-traumatic stress syndrome, and it's a wonderful way to study me memory as well. <coughs> so we have too many bars now, so I'm simply going to change and look at this bar, which is the operational definition, remember, of fear. So from now on, I'm just going to show you <coughs> prior to training, you have a lot of fear. After extinction, there's no fear. It's not forgetting because exposure to context doesn't do anything. And as you look here, you'd say, well, they're afraid here, they're not afraid there, maybe that fear memory has been erased. But as I mentioned, there's a very large and important literature showing that extinction is not an erasure of that memory, but it's a new form of, of a memory. <coughs> One of the classic studies was done by Mark Bowton. You train animals, you give them a pretest, now you give them lights, in this case with startle, and you test them just as I showed you. But if you take these same animals now, that it looked like they're extinguished here, and you move them to a different place, you get a uh, restoration. So it couldn't have been erasure, because if they go to a different place, they, in a sense, relapse. And there are other measures of relapse. You can get the same effect if you stress the animal or wait a long time afterwards. Later, I'm going to tell you that I think a lot of this is slightly exaggerated in rats, because they have no ability to try to re-expose themselves to a cue. And later, I'm going to show you some data where people that have had this treatment with decycloserine show more um, real-life height situations in that case. So they extrapolate outside of these um, conditions. So I think some of these measures of relapse are actually um, um, overstated in rats. So don't let Joe Ledoux tell you that extinction is not that good because of these measures of relapse. because. Um, they're not that bad in humans. Nonetheless, it is a form of learning, and <coughs> there is a, a particular protein, the NMDA receptor, the N-methyl-D aspartate receptor, or NMDA receptor, and this has been implicated in learning and memory in a variety of different situations. Uh, over 20 years ago, we showed that if we inactivate this particular protein in the amygdala during the time we pair a light in the shock, the animal no longer learns that association, and that's been replicated by many other different groups. So we wondered then, if this receptor was generally involved in learning and memory, um, would it also be involved in extinction? So uh, Bill Falls and Mindy Miserandino and I trained groups of animals to be afraid of um, the light, as I've been showing you. And then they had now cannulas, little tubes that went down into the amygdala, which we know is the critical fear center in the brain. And we infused them with either the vehicle or an NMDA antagonist called AP5. And now we tested them two days later drug-free. And what you see is very good extinction in the animals that got the vehicle. So that's the normal situation or the control situation. But remarkably, when he, when he activated this protein, with this N-methyl-D-aspartate antagonist, we totally blocked extinction. So that was the first evidence that NMDA receptors are involved not only in fear conditioning, but also in fear extinction. And um, we wondered then, <coughs> because psychotherapy is so dependent on extinction, whether we could facilitate extinction and thereby facilitate um, psychotherapy. So um, again, the NMDA receptor is a complicated a receptor with lots of binding sites. This is where glutamate binds to the NMDA receptor. But there's another receptor on actually another subunit called the glycine regulatory site. And it turns out that these amino acids called glycine or serine are critical for the NMDA receptor to work. And furthermore, under certain circumstances, this receptor is probably not saturated because certain compounds, such as D-cycloserine, which is obviously an analog of serine, can bind to and make the NMDA receptor work better. So the idea is, if we could facilitate the activity of the NMDA receptor, could we facilitate extinction? Before we could do that, we had to do a little parametric study. And so what we did is we gave only 30 lights. I've been showing you everything with 60 lights and 90. <coughs> so 60 is too much extinction, and 30 is kind of just right. So um, it's about 50% extinction. So now we're going to use 30 lights and now give either decycloserine or uh, saline. So um, this is work by Dave Walker and uh, Carrie Ressler and Cork Tug Lou and myself. 
So three groups of animals, we train them, we give them that pre-extinction test, they're all afraid, and now we give simply 30 lights with saline and we get about 50% extinction, but if we add decycloserine and the 30 lights, we about get double that. And you can't give decycloserine all by itself. Oh, also, we're testing these animals two or three days later when decycloserine is long out of the system. So this is not an anxiolytic effect of decycloserine. This is an effect of decycloserine in facilitating this process of extinction. <coughs> and you can't just give decycloserine. You have to combine it with the exposure, if you will. Decycloserine by itself is not either anxiolytic or anxiogenic. Um, it just seems to work by facilitating this learning process that we call extinction. Well, if you think about it, many forms of cognitive behavioral therapy are either explicitly exposure therapy um, or variants thereof. So um, simple phobias is probably the obvious, most obvious example. If you're afraid of snakes, you don't look at snakes, you don't touch snakes, you don't let them crawl around your neck. But if we can get you to start looking at pictures of snakes and then bring them in the office in a jar, let you finally touch them and learn that they're not all poisonous, as we know, that's a very, very effective treatment for so-called simple phobias. But people that have a panic attack, you take them back to where they had a panic attack, make them realize that they don't have it every time they go there, and that's a form of exposure therapy. People with obsessive compulsive disorder, you make them touch the bottom of a toilet seat, but they don't allow them if they have a contamination phobia to wash their hands. It's very anxiogenic, but for better or for worse, that's a reasonable treatment for obsessive compulsive disorder and so forth. It's very painful, a lot of dropout and so forth. So could we facilitate this extinction process in psychotherapy? Oh, sorry, but I forgot to say, that's where I'm headed, but I forgot. Um, I want to tell you also a very interesting study from Rick Richardson's group that shows that you can give decycloserine after extinction and it has a time dependent facilitation. So this is freezing. <coughs> These animals are um, afraid of a tone. The saline animals freeze a lot <coughs> even after extinction because they had a very small amount of extinction. If you come in right afterwards and give decycloserine after extinction training, you get a very substantial facilitation, that is a decrease in freezing. If you wait four hours, that more or less goes away. And so at four or five hours, it's back to normal. So that says that there is a consolidation process that is operating on this extinction with a window, in this case, of probably four or five hours. And we believe now that most of the effects of decycloserine are on this consolidation process. And because of that, we don't recommend giving the decycloserine very far in advance of psychotherapy because you want to cover the consolidation period that is going on for a long time afterwards. We think we can extend this a little bit because we have some unpublished data now that decycloserine given five hours after that is out of that consolidation window can still facilitate extinction. So <clears throat> there are two drugs here, two drug treatments. They either get saline prior to extinction and then saline four hours afterwards. And there's essentially no gain consistent with the, the other study I showed you. If you give decycloserine before training, um, there is some gain, so that's just a replication. If you give saline the first time and now five hours later <coughs> you give decycloserine prior to sleep, we're always testing 24 hours later out of drug-free, um, there's a marked facilitation, and giving it twice didn't seem to help. Um, decycloserine does show very rapid tolerance, and one of the reasons that it hasn't worked as a cognitive enhancer is because of that tolerance. So the trials that have tried decycloserine on uh, Alzheimer's disease and schizophrenia, cognitive de deficit in schizophrenia, they've given it on a daily basis, and we know that it gets very, very rapid tolerance. So. Um, but we get around it, we think, by giving these um, medications very infrequently. And there's a growing literature showing that decycloserine seems to work better in stressed animals. In fact, there are a couple of failures using college students and looking at um, decycloserine ability to facilitate, let's say, extinction of galvanic skin response and other kinds of things. These are healthy college students, and it hasn't worked in a, st in a group from um, um, 
Australia, and I think, Arnie, you've done some of that too, or no? Okay, I thought you had, somebody told me. Anyway, there's a growing literature showing that decycloserine facilitates or rescues deficits and extinction after um, various forms of stressors. So um, these animals that have this um, polymorphism of the <coughs> BDNF gene um, have a deficit in extinction, and that can be rescued by decycloserine. Uh, can reverse the disruption uh, produced by a glucocorticoid antagonist, reverses extinction deficits during alcohol withdrawal, um, following stress, um, disruption of extinction, another following stress, uh, following early life stress, um, after sleep deprivation, inactivation of the prefrontal cortex. Um, and there's a lot of studies now looking at cocaine <coughs> um, reinstatement showing that decycloserine can facilitate extinction of cocaine craving, which is obviously a very big um, um, general area of interest to a lot of people. So there's been a lot of um, replication of this decycloserine effect. Um, and because of all that, Kerry Ressler, Barbara Rothbaum, and I um, did the first double-blind placebo-controlled study using decycloserine in people that have fear of heights. Um, Fear of heights is not a major psychiatric problem uh, in, unless you have it yourself. Um, these are people that don't fly. They hate to go up elevators. Um, one of the people in the um, study was a very articulate school teacher, and um, <coughs> she and I have been on lots of programs together. Mm -hmm. And uh, she had to drive 45 minutes out of her way, going both to school and back because she was terrified that you'd have a panic attack going over a high bridge in Atlanta. So it really impacts on their day. And um, so we picked, chose people that have fear of heights because Barbara Rothbaum has been a pioneer in the use of virtual reality. So these people that I'm going to show you in a second, you know, everybody know what virtual reality is? Put on goggles, they're really TV cameras. And as you look around, um, it looks just like a real scene. So she has a virtual audience. And if I had, had, was looking at the virtual audience, there would not be a soul in this room. But as I look around, I would see Arne over here, and I would see you over here, and the camera, and so forth. It looks very real if you get into that. So that was the situation. And of course, for experimental psychologists, it was perfect, because everybody gets exactly the same form of therapy. They get, and then usually it takes about eight sessions. So we purposely chose only two sessions of giving this virtual reality of fear of heights with either placebo or decycloserine. We used a couple of doses. I'm going to combine the doses because there wasn't a difference. We had a bunch of pre-test measures and post-tests. So this is what it looks like to the subject. They have the um, <clears throat> goggles on, and this is the um, elevator that they're going to ride up, and they're going to have to walk out on these catwalks. And I watched some of these subjects, and they are sitting there. It doesn't look very realistic, and of course, it's not captured in this still. But um, these people are sitting there. There's nothing around there, and they're just absolutely white knuckled. So people that are really afraid of heights, they really kind of get into this psychologically. Um, this door is going to open here. They're going to have to walk out onto that catwalk. And when they do, when they look down, it's kind of like being in a high, big Hyatt hotel somewhere. So it's a very anxiogenic situation for these um, patients. And this is now the level of anxiety going from 100 means the most terrified you've ever been as a function of this virtual floor. So as you go up higher and higher in the virtual elevator, so it looks farther and farther down, um, you get a, a rather nice relationship by the level of anxiety in the floor. This simply shows the data from the first session, the first virtual reality session with the drug, and it shows that the drug is neither anxiogenic or anxiolytic. So decycloserine, as I said, does not reduce or enhance anxiety. <clears throat> we had a one-week follow-up, but also a three-week follow-up. So the drug is long out of the system. The half-life in a human is about um, eight hours or something like that. So the drug is far gone at three months. And yet this was the gain. So what this is is a difference <clears throat> going from the um, post minus the pre, so a negative score is down going, so this is improvement. The people that got two sessions with placebo have some gain, but not very much. The people that got decycloserine had a much, much greater significant gain. And as I said one before, 
Um, the, the most important thing is that when we test them and ask this woman, now do you drive over that bridge,